On the docket, a bizarre case out of Chicago, Illinois, involving a former professor, and I mean like a high-end professor at Northwestern University who was like an expert in microbiology. This guy was doing big-time stuff, but there was an, uh, according to prosecutors, right, because it's just an allegation at this point, there was another whole side to his world and his life involving this weird um, murder sex fantasy that ended up playing out and they say, as a result, he stabbed and killed his boyfriend after stabbing him 70 times while acting out this bizarre fantasy. Those are the allegations. So while he was locked up, COVID hit, and his attorney was trying to get him out on bond, not because of the dangers of COVID in jail, but because of his expertise that maybe, just maybe, he could help find the vaccine and, you know, join the team. Unbelievable uh, turn of events. Uh, Chanley Painter has more for us tonight. Uh, what my lab has been doing for a number of years is really trying to understand the basic biology of Yersinia pestis. How does it cause plague? Wyndham Latham, seen here giving a lecture, was a former professor at Northwestern University and an expert in plagues. Today, he is at the Cook County Jail waiting to stand trial for the 2017 murder of his boyfriend, Trenton Cornell Durinlow. He's charged with homicide first degree murder. Latham's lawyer, Adam Shepard, argues that his client's expertise in bubonic plague could help in the fight against COVID-19. He is one of the leading researchers of microbiology in the entire nation. This fact is beyond refute. The bond motion seeking Dr. Latham's release includes letters from top experts vouching for Dr. Latham and the need for his expertise in battling COVID-19. Before Latham was arrested, he was cleared by the government to handle the most dangerous biological agents, including the Ebola virus. And Latham is currently helping to fight the threat of coronavirus at the Cook County Jail the site of one of the most aggressive outbreaks in the country. For instance, um, staff was handing out medication without gloves or without hand sanitizer. And Dr. Latham, early on, this was weeks ago, he, he advised against that. And I believe since that, uh, now they wear gloves or at a minimum use hand, hand sanitizer before dispensing medication. His attorney argues the jail is not a safe place and is seeking his release on bond. Dr. Latham's medical conditions put him at a substantially elevated risk for contracting severe COVID-19. Shepard says there is precedent for releasing an inmate early on the condition that he uses his expertise to help the government. I'd like to cash this check here and then I'd like to take you out for a steak dinner. That was the case of Frank Abagnale. His life made into a movie. Catch me if you can. Dr. Harris. Yes? Do you concur? Concur with what, sir? Abagnale helps the FBI investigate crimes committed by fraud and scam artists. Most of the speaking I do when I walk up to the podium is very technical. It deals with cybercrime and identity theft, forgery, embezzlements, and things of that nature. But the judge ruled against Latham reminded of the horrific details of his alleged crimes. Prosecutors say Latham and his alleged accomplice, Andrew Warren, allegedly stabbed Cornell Duran Lowe more than 70 times in what investigators describe as a murder sex fantasy. Dr. Latham has persisted in his plea of not guilty of those charges. The allegation involves an alleged stabbing of uh, Dr. Latham's close friend. While Latham maintains his innocence, Warren has pleaded guilty and is expected to testify against the former professor. For now, Latham remains in custody, pending the outcome of his trial. All right, joining us tonight from Chicago, Illinois, the criminal defense attorney currently representing entertainer R. Kelly, Steve Greenberg. Uh, are you in Chicago or are you on vacation? I'm actually in uh, Palm Desert, where I'm stuck in my room, but uh, but it's a great place to be stuck. Okay, okay, but, all right, so you know these, let me ask you first of all, how do you think Dr. Latham is doing in the Cook County Jail? 
Well, they, they do have a unit where they put uh, older people, and he's probably in that unit. Uh, he's probably in, in a solitary situation. It's, it's not a good situation because everyone in the county jail is not being allowed out of their cells. They don't get recreation or anything like that. But they, they have an obligation to protect people before you're convicted, after you're convicted. And they're actually pretty good at segregating people out at the county jail. All right, let's take a look at this case, right? Uh, there's a, there was a co-defendant. He's the one who took the deal. Mm -hmm. He's going to testify against uh, Dr. Latham. But I've got to think, this is a, a, one of those cases where if you're planning this murder sex fantasy and cooking it up, I've got to think there might be some level of a digital footprint, you know, talking about this thing. Maybe if there's 70 stab wounds, some physical evidence as well. Um, Tell me about the approach that you take in a case like this when you're representing someone uh, like Dr. Latham. Well, it's very difficult because I think the strongest piece of evidence they actually have is that he wrote a letter to his colleagues and his friends, uh, an email, just before he turned himself in. And while, while it might not come out and say in that email, uh, I stabbed the guy 70 times, it certainly has a level of um, concession in it, uh, agreement, sorrow, remorse, and, and those are things that can all be turned around. This is a very, very difficult case. The physical evidence isn't the problem. When you stab somebody, you're not going to leave a lot of physical evidence unless you cut yourself or uh, you have bloody clothing, which in this case they were able to get rid of. But the crime scene itself is, a, is his apartment, and, uh, and there's digital evidence showing that he wanted the person to come there and they were supposed to do some sort of a hookup and so forth. And then there's the co-defendant. So having said all that, I'm not sure how to even answer your question because I don't know where you would start uh, with this. I think the co-defendant started the only place that his attorneys felt they could, which is cutting a cooperation deal uh, to try and get him out of trouble. I would think that you have to sort of try some kind of a uh, an unusual psychological defense that that someone has some kind of a, a psychological disorder because I don't think that stabbing people to death uh, for sexual pleasure is is normal behavior and you might be able to sell some sort of a, a an insanity defense on that. Yeah, the, the fact that they seem to flee or allegedly flee from everything, I mean, that's another problem, right? I mean, that you can well, look at that and say, hey, that's consciousness of guilt. You've done something wrong. That's why you left. So, Vinny, what, when they do these evaluations, whenever anyone ri raises an insanity defense, you know, the best one is where you can say there's a little Martian standing on my shoulder and talking to me and saying, do it, do it, do it. And after they do it, you just kind of hang out there because you're still listening to the Martian that's on your shoulder, the little green man. Uh, but what they always say when you raise an insanity defense is they look at the behavior that you had afterwards. Did you clean up the crime scene? Did you flee? Did you know what you did was wrong? Because of course, for insanity, the, the real question is, did you appreciate that what you were doing was wrong? And if you take actions to cover up the crime, if you flee, then that shows that on some level you appreciated what you were doing was wrong and, and thereby were not insane. So it's very difficult and it's very problematic that they did that. But it's also such a weird crime and such a weird set of facts. And, and you know, that such a, a, a genius like this would think to do such a thing. So you might be able to, to take it sort of out of the norm of the insanity cases. Well, let's, let's talk about that part of, of this case, which is the defendant, not your normal defendant. I mean, this right. is a guy who's super accomplished, super bright, um, respected by colleagues, has done great work. How, how, is that a plus or a minus in this case? I, I think it depends on, on where you're going with the case. I mean, typically when you've got someone like this, I think you the jurors are a little more sympathetic to the person. Um, they'll look at the case more carefully before convicting, and they're going to wonder why would a guy guy like this do this? You know, I did a, a, a serial killer I represented once, and we put on a very unusual insanity where we claimed that psychopathy was a birth defect, and we were able to do this imaging of his brain and show that his brain wasn't wired 
like a normal person's and he reacted to situations or perceived situations differently than a normal person and we were successful. You may be able to do something like this. This man is so brilliant. His brain doesn't work like other people. So you can't look at it in sort of the traditional insanity mode. You have to look at how he functioned and and, and this part of his brain is taking so much that this part of his brain maybe didn't know or something like that. Yeah, that's that's going to be tough. But, uh, you know, that's you know, this is this is amazing because every case I look at and sometimes like, oh, why is this even a case? But there's always an issue. And, and great defense attorneys like you uh, understand that there's subtleties in all these and, and differences. Um, how about the co-defendant here, though? I mean, he took the deal and typically in cases that we've covered here on Court TV, when someone takes a deal, this becomes public enemy number one for the defense. This becomes the person that gets attacked. I'm looking at this guy's mugshot. Uh, he doesn't look likable. He, he looks, I mean, he looks much more like someone that would be involved in something like this if there is a look. I mean, well, not in this picture. Mm. Here he's smiling. But in those mug shots, he looks horrible. Um, how much of an attack is it going to be on him uh, when this trial goes? Well, they're going to have to go after him quite aggressively. But uh, again, the two of them fled together. Uh, Latham drives this guy to the police station to turn himself in. So, you know, you choose your your friends. That's something uh, you were a prosecutor. You used to get to say, oh, all the yeah. time you would say, look, the defendant chose the witnesses. I didn't chose the witness. The defendant chose this person to commit this crime with. So anything that's bad with this person, you know, spills over to the defendant. Uh, they got a lot of problems when they've got the guy cooperating who you drove to the police station so that he could turn himself in. All right. Now, take us behind the curtain, all right? You represent, say you're representing someone like this, and you know the deck is stacked. You know it does not look good. Um, how, how do you have that conversation before the trial? I mean, do you prepare someone for, hey, look, this is, this is not going to be easy? Right. Well, I, you have to do it in a way that you don't want at the end of the conversation them to say you're fired, you know, because... Uh, you, you have to be honest with your clients and, and people don't want to, you know, that's the worst part of the job, but that's why we're called attorneys and counselors, because we're giving advice to people. And, and a lot of times it has to be the advice that they don't want to hear. You'll see attorneys who plead everyone guilty and, and tell everyone that, that, you know, I did a great job for you and it could have been so much worse. And they're, they're like car salesmen. You know, they could sell anything. They can convince someone of anything. But you have to be able to have that honest conversation with your client and say, these are the facts. Now, in a, in a case like this, look, uh, this judge that he's in front of is, is a bright judge. He's a tough judge. Uh, he went, he was a prosecutor for years and then he became a judge. And the sentence is 20 to 60 years. Possibly you could get life on something like this, but figure it's 20 to 60 years. You have to do 100% of your sentence. So there's no, almost no downside to going to trial in a case like this. This judge would probably give this guy 30 or 40 years at a minimum, which means he's going to die in jail. So while you have to have that discussion with your client, I think that this person's realistic. They know what they did. They know what they're facing, and that, but they know that, that they've got no choice. Steve Greenberg, always great to see you. Appreciate your time okay. tonight. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Happy New Year, Vinny. You too. Thanks. All okay. right, folks, we continue to track this one. Uh, no trial date set yet, though. When, it, when there is one, of course, you'll hear about it right here on your front row seat to justice.